Welcome to December. We got an exciting show for you here on Dollars and Cents, where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. My name, of course, is Joel Garris, certified financial planner and a certified financial fiduciary at Nelson Financial Planning, where we got a great team of great folks who have been joining me of late on the program. Certainly, I think the last two Sundays here, we were joined by a fellow certified financial fiduciary and national social security advisor, Rob Field. Uh, today, it is just me. So back to our old time format of my monologue. Hopefully, we'll make it a more interesting one for you to really enjoy. we got a couple of great topics on the program this week. First of all, we got to talk about November, right? That closed out on Thursday. Who would have thought, think back to just five or six weeks ago, a lot of hand wringing going on in terms of kind of what was going on in the economy and inflation and what was going on in the markets. If you think back to August and September, there was a, a drift down of about 10% in the overall markets. And, and I think what we've seen of late is it, 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 it's just interesting to see how quickly things can move in the markets. And then all of a sudden, November, poof, up 9% for the markets. And ultimately, the best month for the markets in, over, in like a couple of years. And it's just, I think, really underscores this this notion of look if you're not following sort of the financial fundamentals things that we've talked at length over the course of the 35 plus year history of this radio program then you you're, you're going to get it wrong you, you just are and you're going to miss out on opportunity because if even if you think back even further to sort of what this year was supposed to be it was supposed to be a bad year, recession and high unemployment. And now here we are in December, not nearly as bad as it was. And certainly just the investor sentiment swing within the past couple of months sort of underscores that. So if you've got a diversified portfolio, and hopefully you do, and if not, you should really come and chat with us about that at the office at Nelson Financial Planning, then the reality is that you've navigated the year decently enough. You should see that, okay, I'm up maybe 10 or 11 or 12% for the year that was supposed to be a terrible, terrible year. So the question that I guess you need to be asking yourself and the question that you really want to focus on is, is that what you have seen? Are you on track for that? Are you on track for when you look at your diversified portfolio for calendar year 2023, are you on track for a decently positive year that in fact is probably going to wind up maybe a little bit above what the long-term historical averages are? Is that what you're seeing? Are you seeing that in how your diversified portfolio should be performing? Because if you're not, probably want to start asking some questions about how ultimately you're invested. And maybe it's not the right investment allocation. Maybe it's not diversified. Maybe it's got a bunch of nonsense in there that was introduced to you because it sounded good. Maybe it was a structured note or an equity link product or something like that, that at the end of the day, uh, those all sound great. But if you just kind of stick to the fundamentals, you're going to be fine. And in fact, probably turn out better than what you would with all of those sideshow attractions that are out there on a regular basis. So, that could be one issue. The other issue is maybe you kind of forgot the fundamentals. Maybe you forgot some of those fi fundamental financial fundamentals that we've talked about for years and years and years on this program. So we thought it would be good to maybe recap those for you on this week's program. Uh, we've got seven of them, or at least uh, we, we, we have seven of them that we have described 
in our new book, Next Gen Dollars and Cents. We talk about these financial fundamental principles early in the book, as you might well imagine, because they're kind of fundamental foundational building blocks to how you achieve financial success, which of course is what the book is all about. Uh, as you know, we've certainly been talking about a bit on the on the program since the book was published last month, or I guess actually in October, at the very uh, middle part of October. The reality is that you really uh, have an opportunity to request an absolutely free copy of the book. We send it to you uh, absolutely free. It's a hard copy of the book. It's entitled Next Gen Dollars and Cents. And so it really is a, 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 toolbox full of different types of financial concepts that are important to describe. No matter whether you're the next gen and you're maybe in your 60s and there's a generation in front of you that maybe you are taking care of, but ultimately you're probably going to inherit money along the way. What do you do with that? How do you approach that? Or if you're the generation, the next gen that is just starting out in the workforce, how do you set up a, a 401k. What's the best way to do that? Uh, I'm, I'm walking both of those paths right now in my own personal life. We have a, a elderly parent that we uh, take, take care of. And then uh, my oldest son started a new job, graduated from college, started a new job. And so he's got the 401k that he needs to sign up for. So all of those things are things that we talk about in the book. And again, hard copy, free for the asking, just call the office 407-629-6477, or you can visit our website at nelsonfinancialplanning.com to get your free copy of that. So before we go into kind of the conversation about the, fun, uh, the fundamentals, which I think is particularly important, given the perspective of what this year was supposed to be, it's supposed to be a bad year, wound up not being a bad year. If you think back to just where sentiment was in September, and now it's December, sentiment has clearly changed as well from an investing perspective. Perspective. So, but one of the things that we wanted to talk about before that is sort of the conversation of, I guess, one of the more recent fads out there that, in our view, was always just sort of another marketing approach. We've been doing this business long enough to know that the financial services industry is really, really good at marketing things. They like to bring things out when everybody is getting engaged or interested or when that topic is sort of absolute top of mind. So over the years, we've seen uh, funds that are focused on the internet or funds that are focused on information technology or funds that are vo focused on pharmaceutical. I mean, all of those types of things the industry has a pretty good job of rolling out investments that are specifically focused on that item that everybody is talking about. The problem is it's usually too late and the track record isn't particularly good because these products, these investments come out when they're getting all the attention, but more often than not, there's not really the performance that goes with it. The latest trend, and, and certainly the numbers would back that up, is this conversation about ESG investing. So for those of you who don't know, ESG investing looks specifically at environmental, social, and governance types of rules. And the reason I say that this is really kind of a marketing thing is when you stop and think about it, that those types of parameters were always in the mix. <coughs> Excuse me. If you think about how you pick individual companies, right? So you're not going to pick a company that's paying its CEO a hundred times, you know, or an overinflated amount, <coughs> excuse me, of money. Because if you do, then, you know, you're not getting the same level of profitability that you should if you're overpaying that CEO, right? Makes sense. That, that goes to governance of a company. Similarly, if the company is dumping, you know, sewage into the river, that goes to an environmental concern. But what happened is that over the course of the past few years, they sort of bundled all of these together and packaged them together to really make them more about a marketing effort. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this ESG stuff and how it's all kind of playing out, particularly based upon some of the most recent data that's come up. Coming up next year on Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning.
So we're talking a little bit about sort of the latest fad, if you were the latest marketing that the financial services industry has engaged in, and that comes back to ESG investing. We've talked about it before on the program. Certainly the concept of looking at environmental or social or governance issues isn't necessarily a new concept, if you will, in the in the investment industry, because you don't want a, a company that treats its poor, its employees poorly, right? Because if they are, you're probably not getting the same level of productivity out of those employees. You don't want a, a company where the CEO is making 100 times what they should. That doesn't make any sense. That obviously impacts the profitability of that company company. And you don't, similarly, you don't want a company that's dumping toxins into rivers because ultimately that's going to become a liability of the company, cost the company and hurt its profitability. Look, those factors were already out there, but lo and behold, the financial services industry saw an opportunity to sort of market to this type of of topic. And they really did lean into it pretty dramatically except it backfired and it it backfired on a couple of different levels. First, it backfired as most of these marketing efforts usually do, but this one backfired for a somewhat unique aspect in that it backfired because it, it sparked political conversations about what exactly all of this meant. So that in and of itself created a tremendous reaction uh, along with, uh, I mean, almost like a, like a, remember New Coke, right? Remember when Coca-Cola introduced, hey, we're going to roll out New Coke and it's going to be, you know, better than the old. Um, ESG packaging is the same description of what you typically would have looked at at a company in terms of whether it was a good company to invest in, but lo and behold, uh, it wound up not really resonating with people much like new Coke did. And so they brought back the regular Coke. The harsh reality is that when you look at this ESG stuff, it, 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 it really doesn't work. And you're starting to see those underperformance numbers come out and the investing public is now coming to grips with this reality. The Wall Street Journal this week in an article referred to it as this year, 2023, being the year where the fantasy ended. Because ultimately, as we know, there's a cost to everything. And as investors, and remember, if you're a listener to this show, or if you are a client of the firm at Nelson Financial Planning, you may be a retiree, you may be working, you may be whatever you're, you are, but at the core of it, you're an investor. And at the end of the day, what really matters for investors is return. And when you start to use some of this ESG stuff to, to exempt companies or screen out companies because of maybe they are an oil company or maybe they're involved in a particular product or a service or good or whatever the case may be, that for whatever these factors come into play, you eliminate them from being the from being any part of that opportunity to invest in. Well, then now you're excluding them just based upon arbitrary factors and not actually doing the due diligence that you would typically have done. And as investors, return ultimately is the most important thing. So when you look at these conversations about, oh, I want to get to net zero, carbon emissions, it's costly. And to think that you can just sort of force that ignores how the economy and the allocation of capital ultimately really works. The other comment that I would make is that if your fate or your profitability is tied more to what governmental policy is rolling out in any particular time period, then that's probably not a company that you really want to invest in long-term anyway, because any company should be able to withstand its own, have a product or offer a good or service that irrespective of which way the winds in Washington are blowing politically, that they're going to be able to make it and still be as profitable as they normally would be. Sadly, that's not the case. And I guess one of the reasons why this is on my mind this week is uh, the, 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 the corresponding headline, right? The, 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 the climate change summit, right? That's happening in, wait for it, it's happening in Dubai. Now, 
Um, I actually happened to be in Dubai this past summer. And um, let's be clear that that is a country that is built on oil, which supposedly is the thing that creates all the climate change problems. What's other also interesting is just so we have perspective. And this is why this is why I like to travel, because I think travel gives you some perspective. What it also does for me is it firms up that this country, despite all of its faults and the politics and all that, still the greatest country on earth in terms of how its economy works, how its legal system works, and ultimately how its politics works when it needs to work, I guess would be the caveat there. But you think about Dubai and UAE, here's the thing that you may not know is that there's no pathway to citizenship inside the UAE. You're either part of the seven tribes or you're not. And there's no way you become a citizen of UAE. And in fact, you can lose your citizenship if you marry outside the tribe. That's the reality of it. So it does start to put a little different perspective on the kinds of issues that we struggle with here, right? I mean, think about how other countries are run, particularly those countries that are much more autocratic in nature. That's one of the biggest reasons why I like to travel as much as I do. It's kind of my hobby. My one hobby, pretty much as I was talking to the staff today, I mean, this past week in the office, you know, I, I, I work because I like to work and I enjoy what I do. And, uh, and, and I travel. That's the one hobby that I have. And so the reality is though, it does really give you a good perspective on what's going on in the rest of the world. And it gives you the opportunity to think about it from an investing perspective, right? So you go to a place like Dubai and you see all the oil money and how much that has generated and the wealth that has come from that. And then you start to think about, okay, well then how is this ultimately going to play out? Because there's still a lot of wealth here that's dependent upon oil. Is that does that mean it's going away anytime soon? And the answer clearly when you go to some of these places is, yeah, it's really not. And the reality is that there is a cost to all of this when you think about the kinds of things that ultimately matter as an investor. As you're saying earlier in the show, look, if you're an investor, it's return that matters, isn't it? I mean, it is return that matters. And so, Traveling and kind of observing this allows me to sort of see and to be able to share with our clients the kinds of things to kind of avoid or to navigate that nonsense that is around the, happening around the world. The reality is when you start to look at the data, right, falling demand for, for electric vehicles, canceled wind projects, investors are speaking very loudly on this ESG stuff. And uh, in the third quarter of this year alone, pulled $14 billion from ESG funds. Why? Well, the reality is, as you were saying earlier, performance. If you're screening out companies just solely based upon the type of product that they're offering, the reality is that you may be missing out on a tremendous amount of opportunity. The pain in 2022 particularly was much more acute for climate and thematic pro products that were hit much more dramatically by interest rates and other factors. Because the reality is you've got two things, right? Business and if you've got limited demand for those types of products, and then if you couple that with an increase in the regulatory oversight, then the, both of those factors are gonna ultimately change how much you're gonna be able to ultimately make with um, a, a particular perspective that is exclusionary at best. So certainly depends on uh, and then you toss in the political conversation that r r r rose up, throw in regulatory scrutiny as well. The SEC has found a number of firms that claim that they had ESG type parameters on their investments, but at the end of the day, they did not. So anyway, there you have it. Just some additional thoughts on uh, kind of the ESG side and how that interweaves in terms of the financial fundamentals that we talk about so much on the program. Oftentimes we see it again and again and again where the financial services industry does a good job at sort of marketing to a particular area. This one really backfired on them because it wound up having political consequences. But bottom line, investors have 
rapidly coming to the conclusion they're pulling their money out of these ESG things because the performance just is not there. And at the end of the day, that's what you are as an investor. You're looking for return. We're going to take a break in return here on Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. So there you have it, uh, you know, a little side discussion. I'm not sure how I managed to get off on the ESG stuff quite as much as uh, I did, but a couple of articles this past week did catch my attention, uh, uh, particularly against the backdrop of the climate change summit that's happening in Dubai, of all places. Uh, and then uh, a couple of articles in the Wall Street Journal over the course of the past couple of weeks, uh, one of which noting that 2023 is the year where kind of the fantasy ended, like all, all of this conversation uh, about ESG came bo ultimately boils down as it always does to is there profit and is there money to be made and as investors that's really the question that you should be always asking yourself regardless of anything else that's the bottom line and the reality is that that just did not hold water with um esg in terms of the underperformance and investors really started to kind of speak in volumes on that pulling out 14 billion dollars in just the third quarter of this year from those types of investments so it's one of those things where it does sort of set the stage for kind of a reminder of the financial fundamentals. So whether it's ESG or Y2K or dot com or structured notes or crypto or the list goes equity link products, those are those are all over the place. The list goes on and on and about the stuff that the financial services industry rolls out markets. And it's kind of like new Coke. So it oftentimes falls flat. Maybe it's popular for just like a little bit, but ultimately it winds up going south very, very quickly. It's one of those expressions that we've used on the program before, which says, you know, be an investor, but don't be a knucklehead. And sometimes you wind up getting too involved in these types of new products, things like that, that ultimately really do, um, have a very limited shelf life, if you will, because at the end of the day, you might very well miss out on the ability to achieve return over time. And that's certainly what the second chapter of our new book, Next Gen Dollars and Cents, is all about. So on the program, uh, in this segment and the next, we're going to talk about some of those financial fundamentals because I think it bears repeating, particularly if you think about what's going on in the markets. As you we were saying at the top of the show, the, the markets, if we think back to September, there was a 10% decline during the course of the months of August and September that and into October. That caught everybody's attention. There was a lot of concern, a lot of worry. And if you look at it historically, what most people forget is that a 10% decline during the course of any year is actually pretty normal. If you look at the averages, it happens about once every year, if you look at it on a historical basis. So it's not that that was abnormal. It's just that once again, it causes the distraction to investors and, and really forces them or puts them in the position where they sort of start to ignore the fundamentals. So we asked the question at the top of the program, you know, how have you done this year? How has 2023 been for you in terms of your investment performance? Because at the beginning of the year, it was widely expected it wasn't going to be a particularly good year. Certainly, there's been parts of the year where it haven't been particularly great. But as we sit here in December, things look on track that, hey, wait a minute, this could very well be for a diversified portfolio, a year where you wind up getting a return that's sort of above even the long-term trend averages of that eight, nine percent. So that's good. But then the question is, if you're looking at your own personal portfolio and you haven't done that, well, then that's a problem, right? So maybe it does bear some repeating of some of those financial fundamentals, sort of a handful of essential truths. If you want to read more about these, our book, Next Gen Dollars and Cents, absolutely free of charge at any time between now and the end of this year. We're offering that book free of charge before you have to go to Amazon and buy it for $14.99. The reality is that you can call the office at 407-629-6477. That's 407-629-6477 and ask 
that the we mail you your free hard copy of the book. Many times people are asking for multiple copies of the book, and we're perfectly fine with that. The free offer is an unlimited offer. So if you want to give those to your kids or your grandkids or your great grandkids, this book we feel is a good resource to, uh, a good resource for uh, all of those ranges of financial things that you're going to encounter during the course of your lifetime from the start to the finish so or you can visit our website nelsonfinancialplanning.com and request an absolutely free copy of the book from the website my name of course is Joel Garris and you're listening to Dollars and Cents here uh, coming to you on a host of radio stations throughout the Central Florida region. Also one of the top 25 financial planning podcasts on the World Wide Web. So make sure you check us out there. Once you're there and you found us on whatever particular channel you happen to be on, subscribe to us. And then that way you'll get instantly notified when we upload new content as well. Have any trouble finding us on any of those platforms, go to our website, Nelson Financial Planning. There in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a bunch of icons. Click on the one that looks most familiar, and lo and behold, you get redirected to our channel on your particular platform. So uh, make sure you check us out there. My name, of course, is Joel Garris. I'm a certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary at Nelson Financial Planning, where we got a great team of people who stand ready to help you change your life with a successful and cost-effective financial plan. Also going on at the office, forgot to mention this earlier, we will hold this up for our YouTube audience. Our toy and food drive has one more week. So if you're interested in stopping by the office and supporting Toys for Tots or Second Harvest Food Bank, we are collecting for both of those institutions. We've got two big, large bins from Second Harvest Food Bank where we're collecting food and then a bunch of boxes that are already filled with toys, but there's always room for more for Toys for Tots. That runs uh, through at the office until Friday. So make sure uh, if you are looking to participate that you drop that stuff by before Friday of this week on December the 8th. So um, so, so we'll, we'll, let's talk a little bit about the, 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 these fundamentals because I think this year, as do most years, shapes out to be a good reminder of why it's important to remember the fundamentals. And I want to read you the quote that I included in that second chapter of the book when we talk about these fundamentals, because I think it it, it really summarizes how you need to be thinking about investing from a long-term perspective. And it's a quote from Steve Jobs. and, And here's what it says. It says, simple can be harder than complex. Simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clear to make it simple. Let me read that again one more time. Simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clear to make it simple. The reality is that I think we could say that exact same thing on any of these various fundamental financial truths that exist that ultimately if you follow them consistently you're going to ultimately achieve financial success they sound simple and that's the interesting part of all of these all of these financial fundamentals that we're going to just chat through here on the program you've probably heard them before and they're not necessarily rocket science and they're not necessarily anything grandiose or new They're simple. They're simple concepts. But remember that quote. Simple can be harder than complex. You got to work very hard to get your thinking clear enough in order to make things simple. So without further ado, we'll start. Number one, time in, not timing. You've certainly heard us talk about this one before. My goodness, if I had a nickel for any time somebody says, Joel, you know what? I'm not going to invest right now. I'm going to put it off because I saw this headline or I saw this article or (laughs) these days I saw something on the internet and I'm just not going to do it now because, you know, this ABC is going to happen and that's going to produce X, Y, Z. Look, folks, okay, Time is the only thing that matters when it comes to achieving long-term investment results. In the book, we have a chart 
It talks about the period from 2007 to 2023. 2007, just prior to 2008. And that helps to really define why that time in concept is so important. And we're going to talk about more about that after the break here, uh, after these messages here on Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. So we're talking about some of the financial fundamentals, those truths that exist, that if you follow them on a consistent basis, you're going to achieve financial success over time. We certainly detailed, put those, uh, describe those in great detail in our new book, Next Gen Dollars and Cents. Remember, uh, we are offering that book absolutely free of charge uh, to folks that request it between now and the end of the year. So if you want to use this as a conversation starter for maybe yourself or maybe your kids or grandkids. It provides you the essential tools and strategies to learn, organize, and ultimately achieve financial success. So make sure you go to our website, nelsonfinancialplanning.com and ask for your absolutely free copy of that book. We talk about the financial fundamentals in chapter two of that book. And there's a reason it's early in the book is because these are some of the things that you need to know that you need to get on the table early on in order to make sure that you're going to be able to achieve financial success over time. Remember that article, remember that quote that we were reading in the last segment that we included in the book, Simple can be harder than complex. And boy, when you hear these financial fundamentals, that really is what it's talking about because these concepts are relatively simple, relatively straightforward, but my goodness, people do not observe them on a consistent behavior. If they did, there'd be a lot more folks out there that would have achieved financial success over time than what we see out there in the public at large. Number one, of course, time in, not timing, right? Uh, if you think about that period, and there's a chart in the book that we that we put in that looks at the period from 2007 to, uh, you know, through uh, the beginning of 2023, right? So arguably, suspiciously terrible timing in terms of when you make an investment in 2007, right? That's just prior to 2008, 2009, great financial crisis, all of that happened during the course of the next year. At one point, there was a 60-day period where the account, where, where, the, where the stock market went down about 40% in that 60 days. So not a particularly good timing, right? Uh, but based upon time in, if you look at kind of the return in that 15-year period of time from 07 to uh, the beginning of 2023, you'd be surprised to see, okay, wait a minute, that's a 9% annualized return based upon the overall market. So What's wrong with that, right? I mean, 9% return on an annualized basis and you had a terrible beginning. The reality is putting numbers and dollars and cents on that, that turns $10,000 into roughly about $35,000 over that 15 year period of time. That's pretty good, right? I mean, isn't that kind of what you're looking to do over time as an investor is to kind of achieve that financial success and see those balances grow. Talk a lot, a lot more uh, about, talk about these rules in much greater detail in the book, but certainly the time in time in time in not timing concept, pretty important one. When you stop and look at how things has performed over time. The second concept that we talk about in the book uh, in terms of sort of these financial fundamentals is to pay yourself first, right? So again, simple sounding strategy. Uh, every time you get your paycheck, you take a certain amount of money right out of the gate and put that into your savings, put that into your budget, and put that, put that into your investment account or your retirement account or whatever the case may be. How do you do that? Well, it does come back to that B word, that budget word. One of the things that we do have in the book is some QR codes that you can scan that will link you to a downloadable budget that you can use uh, and save and play around with and ch make changes in. I mean, it really is a pretty robust uh, spreadsheet driven uh, budget that we have available for folks when uh, they get a copy of our book. Um, and, and I think it really is an important tool to use inside because it really does help you achieve that, that concept of trying to pay yourself first and make sure that through a budget that you're able 
to 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 do that. Certainly for folks that are just starting out, it's super important to kind of establish that budget and to be able to use that and track that on a regular basis. Number three on the list of seven is to be consistent, right? So in the book, I talk about the analogy of consistency is actually easier to do than inconsistency, right? Because if to be consistent, you just have to do the same thing again and again and again, um, but all which kind of, you know, seems like that would be easier, right, than taking action uh, that is different than what you had been doing. But, um, but, but oftentimes people do. Oftentimes people get distracted. Um, and, and the other way to think about it is uh, that we talk about in the book is uh, the, the, the expression of just leave it alone, right? Just leave it alone. And I've certainly been on the delivering end of that and the receiving end of, of that expression, as I'm sure our listing audience has been as well. The reality is that that's really hard to do. Uh, and human nature uh, says that, okay, I want to do something, I want to change something, I heard something different, and I want to explore other opportunities or other interests, things that sound much more interesting. And here's the thing that really puts us over the top, and this is a stat that we give in the book. Average American checks their phone 96 times per day. I assure you that that equates to 96 distractions, some of which may cause you to be inconsistent when it comes to your finances and your investments. So just be aware of the forces that are out there that really do make this notion of being consistent to be one that is much harder to do than in fact it sounds like. Number four on our list of those financial fundamentals is to be diversified. And for us, that means to stay away from nonsense. And boy, there is a lot. I mean, we're talking about early in the show, you know, kind of the ESG stuff, uh, the latest fad, if you will, although this one clearly backfired from a marketing perspective because it wound up having political implications and things like that or being a part of the political conversation. But whether it's structured notes or equity link products or limited partnerships or uh, Y2K or dot com or whatever the case may be. There's just a lot of junk out there that ultimately winds up rolling out uh, to in the investing public more from a marketing perspective than anything. So when we talk about being diversified, it's not to be diversified and own a bunch of nonsense. It's to just be diversified among the various asset classes that are fundamental. Stocks, bonds, cash. Make sure you've got a little bit in each one of those categories for various reasons, right? Cash, obviously, stable, bonds, a little less stable, but ultimately more stable than stocks. Stocks ultimately have higher volatility, but a much better return over time. And what people, I guess, struggle with when it comes to diversification is it, it really does mean, and we talk about this in, the, in, in our book, it really does mean that you do accept, in fact, a lower return than what you would get by owning the very best performing asset class every year. The problem, of course, is that you're not going to be able to predict what the best performing asset class is every year because every year it kind of changes. So, yes, diversification means that you do have a lower return than what you might possibly get, but it's the what might possibly get that causes people to get off track, to be inconsistent, and to become not as diversified as they probably should be or misinterpret what diversification really is. Diversification means that you've got parts of the portfolio that are ultra conservative, parts of the portfolio that are conservative, parts of the portfolio that are growth, parts of the portfolio that may even be more aggressive growth. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that you need to have a bunch of silly different products that you've never heard of that you don't really understand because somehow that's gonna create additional diversification. It's not, and it's not going to work. Number five, ignore your neighbor. Boy, this is a popular one. Um, looks are deceiving, as it always has been. The book talks a lot about the Ramsey study that deals with what millionaires actually look like on a regular basis. Compounding, of course, the mathematical wonder, uh, it means that your money grows at a much faster pace than you realize through the power of compounding. And then, of course, you're living longer, so you better be prepared for that. 
uh, to make sure that your money lasts. But if you want to learn and read more of those financial fundamentals, make sure you give the office a call this week, 407-629-6477 to request your absolutely free copy of our new book, Next Gen Dollars and Cents. You can also go to our website, Nelson Financial Planning. Between now and the end of the year, we will mail you out a free hard copy of that book just for the asking. Asking. Well, this has been Dollars and Cents. We hope you enjoyed the show. My name, of course, is Joel Garris, Certified Financial Planner, Certified Financial Fiduciary at Nelson Financial Planning. Thanks for listening to In to this week's program. Have a great rest of the week.